Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode four of The Stare Down. I'm Mallory McCormack, your host, and today's episode is called Blindsided. So if you're ready, sit back, relax, grab a drink or two, and listen to The Stare Down. <laughs> So today's episode is obviously going to involve the filing that happened in a Tennessee court this week between Michael Orr against the Tuohy family. So Michael filed to end his conservatorship with the Tuohys, and boy, did so many people have so many opinions on it. You're either on the side of Michael or you're on the side of the Tuohys. And I'm sure you would all love to hear which side I'm on. And I'm not going to tell you because what I feel like is happening does not matter. I don't know that either side is going to win in this. I don't know that this is something I really actually want to play out and see how it plays out because at the end of the day, this is a family that is being torn apart for various reasons. Money, past trauma, you name it, it's being brought up. And it is not a good situation. But what I do want to address about all of this actually ties into a situation that I had this week. And you've got to love these keyboard warriors. They get on Twitter, they get on Facebook, they get on a news article, and they leave a comment. And of course, they know everything about everything. Their cousin's brother's mother knows the boyfriend of the paralegal that works in a law firm next door to the Tui's office. You'll end up with all of those things, right? And then they put their opinion out there. Well, he's just in it for money. Or why would they try and make money off of him? They already had plenty of money. But that's not the point, guys. The point of the matter is there's a family being torn apart. There is a lot of trauma in his life that has been very well documented in both the book, The Blind Side, and his book, I Beat the Odds. And I believe he actually has a new book out as well. I haven't had a chance to check it out, but I have read both The Blind Side and his book, I Beat the Odds. And y'all, Michael Orr was portrayed very poorly in the movie. He was made to seem like he was dumb, like this sweet white family took him in and without them, he would be nowhere and they made sure that he had this high football IQ by the time he got out of high school and all of these things. But if you read the book, The Blind Side by Michael Lewis, you actually find out that that's not the truth. The movie was made within the Hollywood confines. It was made to be even bigger and better than it truly was in real life. More feel good, more heart wrenching. But Michael actually knew football. He was actually very smart, very intelligent. He was a phenomenal basketball player as well, which most people don't know if you just watched the movie. But Michael's an extremely athletic guy. And so the two E's taking him in did not make his football IQ go higher. Did it maybe provide some opportunities that he wouldn't have had previously? Sure. Beyond that, I don't really care to speculate about anything. All I know is he went to Ole Miss. He was amazing on our offensive line. He went on to be drafted by the Ravens in the first round. He won a Super Bowl, and now he has a beautiful family. His wife, kids, love it for them, happy for them. He's now dealing with some stuff and having to do it in a way that he feels is necessary for him. And that's not my place to judge or speculate as to why. Now, for the Tuohys, I honestly feel like they probably were coming from a good place, wanting to help. I don't know them personally. I don't know anyone who knows them very well personally. But 
I'm never going to speculate on something that happened honestly close to 20 years ago at this point. So it's really hard when you start reading all of these messages and all of these comments on things about what's the motivation or he should be more grateful or, well, he made his money and without them, he wouldn't have even made money. Y'all, that's just stupid because as I told someone earlier this week, the argument that they would never want to make money off of him or make money off of the movie because they already had enough money, that's insane. I'm pretty sure Jeff Bezos has not turned down a single penny since he's made his true fortune with Amazon. I'm pretty sure if someone wrote him a check today for some earnings, he'd more than he'd be more than happy to take it, right? So you can't take that into account. But like I said, it's really hard to watch a family go through this and watch it take place in such a public way. Along with that, this week you saw both a college coach and an NFL coach allow black assistant coaches to serve as head coach within scrimmages or in the NFL's case, a preseason game. So in Lane Kiffin's case, he allowed Derek Nix, a longtime assistant coach, to serve as head coach for the first scrimmage. And in the Titans preseason game, Terrell Williams was allowed by Mike Vrabel to serve as the head coach. And what these two men did with their assistant coaches was allow two very highly qualified black men to get head coaching experience. My hat's off to them. Huge, huge. Both of them pointed out the fact that there are not enough minority coaches out there. Lane Kiffin specifically pointed out that there are zero black head coaches in the Big 12 and the SEC. He actually didn't tell anyone in the media that he was doing this until after the game. And this is where my blindsided moment comes from. So he goes and talks to the media after the scrimmage. He tells them why he did it. He said, you know, Derek is very deserving of this and they need to have the opportunity to showcase their talents. You never know what opportunity may may be out there and let's help them build their resume, right? I applaud both of these men for doing that. So anyway, let's back up a little bit. So Lane tweets out an article that talks about this, and he is talking about his dad and how his dad basically, you know, told him that you need to give opportunities to those as you have them. So I respond to a message that someone has tweeted in reply to Lane telling him that he should basically just sit back And they said couch. I'm pretty sure they meant coach. But that he should just sit back and coach, stay out of politics, because it's, and I quote, bad for the sport. I wanted to know how it's bad for the sport. So I respond back that, one, I don't understand why an Arkansas fan cares what Lane Kiffin is doing. And two, I don't understand how it's bad for the sport. He is allowing someone an opportunity to showcase their talents and to act in a way that their whole career has led towards. I then get attacked and say that I know nothing about what I'm talking about. I should just leave it alone, all of this, that this is this person's happy space and football is where he comes to escape real life. Well, congratulations. If only the world worked that way where we could all just have a happy place to ignore everything. But the people wearing these jerseys and wearing these hats as our coaches and administrators, those are real human beings with real thoughts and feelings. The same way Michael Orr has real thoughts and feelings and real trauma to deal with. And the Tuies have real thoughts and feelings and real trauma to deal with. Lane Kiffin has the same. And so for a fan or not a fan to say that he needs to just keep his mouth shut and do his job, It is so hypocritical because I guarantee you this guy who was telling Lane to basically shut up and do his job, I have no doubt he probably goes into his job and talks politics and all of the ills of the world that bother him, and that's okay. But if there's someone who's maybe escaping a horrible situation at home and so work is their happy place, 
He's not affording them the opportunity to enjoy their happy place. So it's very hypocritical in the way that we as fans interact with these coaches, administrators, and athletes. It's actually pretty disgusting in a lot of ways. So I get blindsided by that. I can handle that, right? I know what I'm here to talk about. I know what I believe in. And I believe that if you've got a voice, use it. If you're going to leave this place better than you found it, go for it. What I then ran into, and this is where it honestly gets a little comical, someone who was not even involved in our exchange, who was a Texas A&M fan, of all things, decides to comment on my looks and apparently my genetic abnormalities and how I have won the random number generator of genetics because I have a gummy smile and crooked teeth. First of all, I'm pretty sure my parents would be very upset if They thought that the money they spent on my braces did not fully correct the crookedness of my teeth. So, hey, mom, dad, sorry for for you to hear this this way, but apparently people don't think it was a good job. And second of all, if I have a gummy smile, that just means I'm really happy and it just is what it is. If that's a genetic abnormality, so be it. I I am who I am. My genes are what they are. There's nothing that I can do about it. So a dear friend of mine jumps in to my aid, tries to explain to this guy that, look, why are you even attacking looks? Why are we even going into this? You're not talking about the issue at hand. Stop. The guy ends up attacking him as well and basically asks if the mental midget, that's a direct quote, is his wife or if I'm just some random person. He explains I'm not his wife. I'm just a dear friend. He can obviously see per our profiles that we are both from the state of Alabama or at least currently living in the state of Alabama. So we then get insulted to be trailer trash because obviously everyone in Alabama lives in trailers, right? I'm pretty sure Nick Saban's double wide is the nicest on the block if that's the case. But I digress. But I'll admit it was hard to read those things. It was very weird and personal to be attacked for my looks when that had nothing to do with what was happening. And I'm glad I've had a couple of days to kind of reflect on it and see where those feelings really come from because I think what it ultimately is is that as a female, I can be running just on my normal everyday run and a guy can roll down his window and whistle at me or cat call me and I'm just supposed to take it. It's gross, guys. Like, it's really gross. And taking it back even further, seeing how on the internet, female athletes, females in general, are subjected to being judged based on our looks or lack thereof, according to some people. It's a really hard thing, especially when we know that, like, we're good, we're smart, we know our stuff. And If guys are intimidated by that, honestly, at this point, that's their problem. It's not mine. I'm still here to speak my truth. I'm still here to talk about what I love. But I wanted to bring up those two situations to kick off this episode because I think it brings it back to, like I said, one of my main points as to why I wanted this whole podcast to even take place. We as fans have to remember that the athletes we support, the coaches we support, They are human beings. They have real thoughts, real feelings, real trauma, as I've said multiple times now. But they are more than just that jersey they put on. They are more than just that clipboard they carry. We don't have to like it. I don't always agree with everything Lane Kiffin says. I don't always agree with everything that every Ole Miss player or former Ole Miss player says or does. But at the end of the day, I was able to get an education and live my life and take the experiences that I had as a student at the University of Mississippi and translate them into a wonderful life now with everything else within my life that has led up to that point. And so for me to criticize someone who is just trying to do the exact same Like I said, whether they're a coach who's going to go on to coach Auburn one day or coach in the NFL or do whatever, or a football player who's going to go play in the NFL or 
a female basketball player who's going to go play in the WNBA. That's not my place to judge them. They have to go live their life. And all I can do as a fan is support them to be the best that they can be with the point that they are at in their lives. That's all I can do. And commenting on whether or not I agree with them, that's just not really my place. I don't ever want to shame someone publicly. I may not like someone. I may not care for someone. You'll find out really quick. I'm not really a Tom Brady fan. I'm also not really an Aaron Rodgers fan. But it is what it is. I can also appreciate them for their athleticism and I can enjoy watching the game. I can also respect that Aaron Rodgers went and did his own thing this offseason to figure out what his path forward was going to be. Again, probably not the same path I'm going to take, but good for him. Saying all of that to say, you are cheering for other human beings. You are supporting other human beings when they are on that field of play. They are still human beings. So, I'll get off my soapbox now. And when we come back from this break, we're going to have one of my friends, Megan. She is from the Bully Book Club, which I love. And if you listen to episode two, you heard me and Jamie talking about Bully Book Club. So Megan is a Big Ten girl. She loves all things Ohio. But I'm going to let her tell you about herself a little bit more and get her take on some things, including Twitter trolls and NIL and Tattoo Gate and maybe some Joe Burrow things in there. So Stay tuned, and we'll be right back with Megan. Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed your break. We now have Megan with us. Hi, Megan. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm wonderful. So I've already told everybody that we met through Bully Book Club. We're in the same chat group, but I want you to tell our listeners a little bit about yourself, maybe your favorite teams, favorite sports players, if you play any sports. So yeah, take it away. Awesome. Um, Well, so I am from Ohio, grew up in Cleveland. Um, So my first teams growing up were Ohio State, And then all of the Cleveland teams, my dad's from Cleveland originally and, you know, is leads orange and Brown for the Browns. And, um, you know, so I always grew up with that. And I think it's kind of an interesting perspective because, you know, I didn't, didn't know what a winning team really looked like, um, that could, you know, kind of cross the, cross the finish line. Until, um, you know, you had the, the Buckeyes National Championship uh, win in, um, you know, the Miami game. So, um, but yeah, I grew up with all of those teams and still, um, you know, support the Cavs and uh, the Guardians. And then I live in Cincinnati now and um, my husband is um, <clears throat> a big Bengals fan and obviously Ohio State fan too, but, um, you know, it's been, it's kind of interesting because I have definitely, um, adopted, I would say the Bengals over the last couple of years. I mean, the Browns made it really easy, uh, with all the Deshaun stuff. I mean, and, you know, if nothing else, they made me feel bad for Baker and that's an awful feeling. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> who's gonna eat right I mean it's Baker right. um but also uh, everything else which is incredibly horrible and just makes it very difficult to support the team I, I you know I have mixed feelings because you know I, I do know on some level if they ever manage to win anything that you know my dad and his you know 70 plus years of supporting them would you know absolutely be thrilled but I just personally can't cheer for them especially when we have, um, you know, a really positive team overall here in Cincinnati yeah. now, um, you know, it's like a young team. We've got a young coach and just, you know, oh, everyone well. seems to be trying to do the right thing. Yeah. Is- and you probably have the hottest quarterback, well, outside of Mahomes, um, which that he's just insane, but you've got, got Joe and Joe is, uh, 
Joe Cool. He is Mr. Bingle, I feel like. Yeah, I mean, I think it's been great for the city. And um, obviously, his game day outfits are fantastic. We love that. Yes. Um, and, you know, it, obviously, everyone's a little nervous right now. You, you hate to see the injuries, especially in training camp like that. Oh, yeah. Um, and, you know, I think there's been kind of a lack of info, like a ton of information coming out, which I understand. Um, so I think it, it's really going to be interesting to see, you know, when he does start playing again and how he looks. But, um, you know, and I think that this, I did not have, you know, this experience, but obviously I think the Bengals fans are pretty scarred by the whole Carson Palmer, what happened to him. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot of nerves, but beyond anything else, you just want him to be okay. Oh yeah. And I think it's one of those things too, where it's really good for the game. If he is okay, you know, Mm -hmm. that's one of the things I, understand preseason I understand training camp and all of that you do it really at any level for any sport but god sometimes it's like I just always have a little bit of that nervous energy until they're out of it because it's one thing if you get injured in a game it's another thing if you get injured in practice like that it's just I don't know it just always makes me so so nervous so yeah I could probably never be a coach because I would be just a ball of nerves every single day and be like, please don't touch them too hard, please. You know, but obviously they have to. So. Well, I think it's so interesting too. I mean, just with all the kind of turf debates right now too, because I think by all accounts, this was just kind of a freak accident. And obviously, you know, there were many of those last season across the NFL and even, you know, within college. And I think that it does become really interesting if we're going to see movement, you know, away from turf and more into natural grass. I mean, I don't know if you saw like the whole messy thing, um, yeah. you know, where he says he'll only play on real grass. Yeah. And, you know, that was kind of one of the things too, that, you know, Jamie and I talked about in episode two is like, even the U S women's soccer team, they were having to play all these games on turf and the men were getting to play everything on grass and they were having more injuries than the men. It's like, yeah, move us, move us to what they're playing on. Like, grass is best. And I kind of, I'm interested to see because Ole Miss just put down turf in our stadium this year. So I don't know how that's going to go. So I'm, I'm interested to see how our injuries end up stacking up this year. If that is really a thing or who knows, I, I don't know. It's, it's weird. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I think the whole thing is, you know, it, it certainly the players union, I think they're right to push at least at the very least for more investigation on it. Yeah. Um, you know, because they know better, like, you know, we can all watch, we can all see what the injuries look like. We can see, um, you know, obviously what we see on TV, but you know, they know what it actually feels like. And, you know, and they're, if they're telling us, yes, we can absolutely tell a difference. And I think there's also something you said just from like switching what you're playing on too, week to week as well. You know, if you're used to how, you know, natural grass is going to accommodate, you know, different ways you move and how it's going to respond. And then the next week you go play on turf and you're bouncing back and forth, you know, I think that's something to consider as well. Yeah. And I even love how, like in Arizona, you know, they roll their grass in and out. So it's, you know, the argument too of, well, if it's in a dome or something like that, it's harder to have natural grass. And it's like, but you can still do it. Like there are still ways to do it. So I think, I think the studies are going to be really cool to see what comes out of it. Um, again, like you said, even just that changing back and forth. I mean, I'm, I run and even going from like asphalt to a concrete sidewalk, those are, those are big changes. And I'm, I'm definitely not an elite athlete, but yeah, I can only imagine when you have millions of dollars, you know, resting on your legs and how they perform every week, you probably want some consistency there. Absolutely. Um, And just even like, and then what you're practicing on. I mean, I think that there's, it's not just, you know, one stadium and one game and what surface they prefer, but, you know, having consistency across the board, I think it's important. And not everybody can be like messy and say, well, I'm only playing on real grass. (laughs) Exactly. I wish I could. I wish I had that much power that I could just say, oh, I'm only going to do this, you know, or I'm only going to drink Starbucks today, but no, I guess we can't do that. Can we? (laughs) It would be nice. It would be awesome. So obviously, you know, love the fact that you are in big 10 country. 
Uh, Big 10 has had some interesting things happening. Big 12 as well. Everybody's kind of moving and shaking a little bit. But one of the things that I know you and I had talked about was a lot of the NIL stuff. And earlier in the episode, I was kind of telling everyone how I had some interesting issues on Twitter and how it just, it completely took me like back. It just took me to a place that I wasn't aware that was there and touched a nerve because it's just someone who's randomly looking at like this profile picture I've put up and reading, you know, however many characters I've typed and they're just starting to attack me on it. So, you know, I know you said that you've got a lot of social media experience and stuff. So kind of what are your thoughts on social media, specifically maybe Twitter and NIL and athletes, because I think, you know, they are out there more, they are putting their brand out there, but in doing that, you're opening yourself up to so much just hate for lack of better term. I mean, people just, they love to hate. So what do you think about those kinds of things? Well, I mean, I think it's interesting because, you know, in some ways this is all so new, right? Even just like how Twitter or X or whatever we're calling it. Um, I think, you know, in a lot of ways we feel like it is been around forever, but, you know, if you just look at, you know, the evolution, it's still something where I think we as a society have to figure out how we are going to you know, conduct ourselves because right now it, it's truly the, the ability to be anonymous is, you know, it, it gives people so much power to say things that they would never say in real life. Um, you know, and obviously there, there's the absolutely horrible trolls. I mean, I'm sure if anyone listened to this, because I know what, what happens to women on the internet, I, I, in the back of my head, I have a counter going on every time I've said, um, as I formulate my thoughts and, uh, I'm sure that that would be something that people would find to criticize because I know, you know, just even doing this and I'm sure, you know, I haven't seen what, um, exactly happened to you on Twitter, but I know just from you know, listening to their podcasts and, and, you know, talking to people who do this, the amount of policing around female voices yes. with up talk and, and, you know, all of that, you know, can bring you into criticism. And then I think, you know, you're obviously by doing this podcast in the first place, treading into a space that some people may consider to be a traditionally male space, which then it formulates even more of an attack. But I think in terms of players, I think we're in a really tough place right now. If you're a coach, um, particularly at a power five school, you know, there, there's a whole, there's a whole department that works on this. And if you don't want to look at your Twitter and see what the people are saying about you and you have that um, also personal fortitude, because I think it's really hard. I mean, you see this with celebrities too. Everyone's like, well, just don't look at what people say about you on the internet, but it's really hard not to. Right. Um, but if you're a coach, you know, there are, there are people who can look at this for you because of, you know, arguably it's part of the job and, you know, especially in this day and age in terms of like recruiting and things like that, you, you have to have that social presence. Um, but if you're a, if you're a player, there's nobody, there's nobody protecting you. And at the same time, you really do, I, I'm sure, you know, especially with NIL deals and then just, you know, even trying to look at deals, if you were to, to make it to the next level, you, you have to, you have to have a social media presence to build your personal brand. Basically. Right. You can't not be present, um, you know, and that's how you're going to get attention. That's how, you know, potentially you're going to, you know, grow your career outside of your sport. Um, and I, I think it's so hard because it just goes back to the commodification of athletes in general. And you see, you know, over the, you, you always see players talk about fantasy and how that has also contributed to this idea that players are not people. They're just, you know, they're just there to score points for your fantasy team so you can, you know, be your brother-in-law. I don't know. Uh, so you don't have to shave your head for losing the, the league at the end of the year, right? Something right. stupid. Yeah. Exactly. And... People are also, 
you know, I think in general, as a society right now, we also all have such short attention spans and everything. It becomes so much like, what did you do for me lately? And I, I know personally, so I am a very nervous game watcher. Um, yeah, I'll pace if, you know, things are happening that starting to feel stressed about my team. I will often bad habit, but I will go onto Twitter for, you know, some sports writers I like and, you know, who support my teams and just kind of like see what people are saying, you know, and a lot of times you'll go on and I don't know, maybe I don't, maybe Ole Miss fans are better, but I do find that a lot of Ohio State fans in particular, especially last year, um, you know, it'd be like, well, first play of the game just had kickoff and, you know, people are on there like, I can't believe we didn't, you know, return for a touchdown. Coach Day should be fired. How is he still our coach? We need to get him out of there. And you're just like, guys, they've been playing, you know, the game just started. Yeah. Um, oh, no. And don't worry. Ole Miss fans are not better. We same. Like they're awful and they say stuff like that. And and why is this player still there? How dare he like, you know, make a mistake? I, yeah, it's disgusting. I have a hard time with it. Cause I just want to defend them. Like I want to defend them all. And I think it's just this idea of like, you know, this kind of anonymous forum that you created because you also wonder, you're like, would you see half of this stuff in person? Because if you would, I don't even know who you're watching the game with. Right. Like I, the, just the amount of sheer negativity, even when things are going well, I mean, and you can tell me if, yeah, maybe Ole Miss fans are better, but then you have this contingent of people who, okay, they won, but they didn't win by enough points. So coach day should still be fired yes. you know, or, or Jim Knowles should be fired because, you know, they missed, you know, some blocks or something, you know, like yeah. it's just, um, unrelenting. And I know from personal experience of last year, we were watching, um, the Notre Dame game and my cousin was in a place where he was getting very nervous and you know so he's like oh I just don't I don't know I feel like they're gonna lose I feel like they're gonna lose and we kicked him out and we made him go to another room because you cannot have that kind of negativity so I just I wonder too some of these people you're like do you are you watching with anyone like how how can you just live in this like cesspool of negativity where where nothing is good enough and I mean don't get me wrong like we're all fans like there are certainly things you say Um, you know, when you're watching a game, like, you know, I can't believe we're calling that play again, or like, what is going on here? I mean, I'm certainly guilty of that myself. Like, you know, Oh, absolutely. You know, like, you know, Strat last year, you're like, what? Run the ball. Just run the the dang ball, Bert. Run the dang ball. Exactly. Um, (laughs) but then, but you know, you're not then writing, you know, 50 tweets, just doubling down on it that yes. your point then kids are seeing because that's what these guys are. Like they are kids. They are. Especially it's one thing if you're, you know, complaining about NFL players, although arguably some of them are still kids. Yes. Um, but you know, at that point they're, they're, they were doing a job. They're, they're professional and you know, say what you will about the NFL. Like these are, these kids are still, they are not doing a job. Right. I mean, they are playing a game as part of their college experience. And we can, you know, argue about how true that is in this day and age, especially with the NIL. But at the same time, it's, it's not the same situation. Like these kids do not have contracts. They are not protected. if something right. happens to them. Um, yeah. I mean, you, you sign away things when you, when, you know, you go to the NFL, for example. Oh, absolutely. And I think too, it's, you know, these are so kids who are trying to have a life. And, you know, I, even with my job and my nine to five, I don't want someone standing there and pointing out every single little mistake I make. And so I think that's kind of to your point too, like, how can you be so miserable that that's all you do? And like the one guy told me this week that football is his happy place. So if that's really your happy place and you're still that miserable, like what, what kind of life do you live? And I, I do feel sorry for you because 
it is supposed to be an escape. It is supposed to be fun. These kids are also supposed to be having fun with it. And I think that's probably the hardest part is, you know, when did we become such, and I feel like we've probably always been a little bit of the, what can you do for me now? Like, eh, if you're not, if you're not perfect now, or if it's not just a little bit better and you're not just great immediately, then it's, we'll move on to the next thing. And I think you even see that a lot in like coaching jobs. Oh, well, you didn't beat Alabama enough times or something, you know, it's like you didn't even hang in there with them your first year. It's just, it's a hard thing to come across, but I want to go back to a point that you made early on about being a female, even because I think even with probably the football players, they've probably heard this a lot more, which again is not excusing it or allowing it to happen and providing like that out for people to continue to do it. But I think football being as popular as it is, these, those guys have probably heard it more growing up, but I was told that part of the issues with NIL that they are having with some female athletes is they will get a contract from a business and want them to star and, you know, a commercial or do a photo print ad or something. Well, if it's a football player or a men's basketball player or a baseball player, they're just throwing them out there and letting them sign the contract before they'll even give the contract to the female student athlete. They want her to do like a test shoot and make sure that she looks a certain way and that everything looks up to par. And then they'll talk about giving her an NIL contract. And I find that so gross. Oh, absolutely. (laughs) The double standards are, you know, incredible. And and that's, you know, an ongoing problem. I was, when you were saying that, I was making me think, um, not thinking of her name, but the gymnast, she's an SEC gymnast. Yes. Um, oh, um, you know who I'm talking about. The girl at LSU who it yeah. came out today that she's dating Paul Skeens, the their baseball player. Wow. Yes, I know who you're talking about. She makes like a million dollars or something right. ridiculous in NIL deals. Exactly. But, you know, I think she's even said that, you know, so much of it is not driven by her athletic performance. And obviously she has to be a fantastic gymnast to, you know, be performing at this, at a collegiate level, but it's her appearance. Yes. You know, and the deals that she's getting are also very different from the deals that are being offered to your point to like male players. Yes. Um, and so, and I'm sure that's true across the board. It, It is going to be, you know, there's men do not, are not necessarily held to the same attractiveness standards that women are. No, absolutely. And her name is Olivia Dunn. I think she goes by Livy. Yes. Thanks Google. I had to look that up really fast. But another thing that I read about her today and even kind of to that point of the double standard, she doesn't go to in-person classes anymore. And I know I sort of talked about this a little bit last week with Johnny Manziel, you know, he went to all online classes just because the, fanatical response to him his freshman year was insane, but she doesn't go to classes for her safety, not because like so many people wanted to be around her, but for her safety, which as a female, we probably all know what that means. That means someone has probably stalked her or done some creepy stuff. And I think that's, she's supposed to be a student athlete. The student is supposed to come first and they can't even protect her enough to do that and to go to class like yeah I can only imagine some of the other stuff that female student athletes have to deal with it's it's absolutely a double standard and then it becomes a catch-22 because then these same people you know on the internet will hold it against her that you know that they'll try to argue that because she you know quote unquote you know put herself out there that somehow she you know deserves like the stalking and everything. And that's, I mean, that's that toxic cesspool that you get with um, yes. Twitter in particular. Um, yes. But it's also, I mean, to, to your point, it's such, it, women are just treated so differently. Um, you know, I can, I just can't even imagine. And, and LC is not, it's not even like you've got a small school or something like that. Right. But, 
you know, I didn't go to Ohio State. My husband did, my family. Um, but, you know, he said, and my, like my brother went there and like, they're like, oh yeah, you, you know, you'd see the football players out. You know, you'd see, you know, whoever was the quarterback when they were there, um, you know, or, you know, like the big names. And it was kind of like how you always hear in New York, like, oh, we're too, you know, yeah. we see you, but we're like, we're not gonna, we're not gonna fall on every, we're too cool for that. And I think that's very much like how, a lot of male um, athletes get treated or, you know, and, and but I'm sure like it's difficult for them too. I'm sure on the other side, they're, you know, probably told that, Oh, you know, all these girls like you. So you should just be happy with that. Even if it is making your life more difficult or, you know, making it take three times as long for you to take, go to school or to get to class. Um, yeah. You know, so I mean, I'm, I'm not dismissing that this is difficult for anyone to be a celebrity in this day and age. Right. Um, and then I think it comes back to, you know, the Twitter situation or, you know, the online trolling where you've got these kids who then are expected to somehow not only deal with everything that is being thrown at them and, you know, by bullies and trolls and things like that, but then also not know how to respond to it. Yes. With, you know, no necessarily like real training and, you know, unlike, you know, again, like coaches or something like that where they've got more support and, you know, I'm sure the schools would say, Oh, well, you know, we have people to support, but it's not the same thing, you know? And, and these are, again, kids, their frontal lobes are not developed at this point, um, you know, and they're going to want to defend themselves. And then, you know, the internet also lives forever. Like, I don't know if you remember, um, being from the SEC, but like, do you remember Cardell Jones? Yes. And the infamous, uh, what is it? Uh, we ain't come to play school. Yep. Right? Yep. So, and I mean, I, I'm not sure he, you know, I think he has a great, from what, everything I can tell, he seems to have a very good like sense of humor about it now, but I mean, that haunted him. Yeah. And that's the thing too. And, you know, I've always tried to have this belief, even just in, normal everyday work situations, sending an email, being very cautious of not too many exclamation points, not sounding, you know, overly excited or overly angry and kind of treading that line of you are sending what looks like an emotionless thing, but there's always emotion tied into it, right? Like we're humans. Emotion is tied into everything. And so especially when you do get on the internet, you can't, you can't tweet sarcasm. You can't tweet humor. It just all comes across 90% of the time. I feel like it, it's going to be taken out of context. Heck, probably 99% of the time it's going to be taken out of context because there will be those people who just don't, they don't know you. They don't know how you would normally talk or type something in a text, you know, those kinds of things. And, and it just always, it just is going to get blown out of proportion. I don't know. Um, I don't know if you want to follow somebody affiliated with OSU, but, um, so Jim Knowles, his sister, um, has a pretty prominent Twitter presence and, you know, I, I think she's great. I, I think she's, you know, obviously very knowledgeable about football and, um, you know, kind of has created this presence over, you know, back when he was um, at Oklahoma and then coming here. But at the same time, you know, you can see like the kind of stuff she deals with too. I mean, people yeah. will just, there are some people, you know, who want to have the conversation with her and engage and, you know, like a, pleasant normal way and then there are the people who you know are braiding her because you know her brother is the um defensive coordinator at ohio state and they don't like you know how he's the decisions he's making and they're taking that out on her yeah because she totally has the ability to control that right (laughs) Mm -hmm. but just because like she she put herself out there and i mean i i follow her i think she's really funny and I like, I enjoy her, like her takes on things, but, um, you know, then you start to read the replies and you just see how, I think it's very rare 
to find any sort of Twitter engagement where you don't have some sort of trolls or people who are just coming in to take some sort of a very aggressive position, be it, you know, because they had a bad day and they want to, you know, they, they're taking it out on people or, you know, they just get some sort of weird kick out of, you know, trolling or what's going on, like the bigger picture. But I, I think it says something that I don't, I'm not sure you can find anything now, especially with it, with how it's being run now, where there is just, you know, a purely positive back and forth. And at least when you were mostly, you know, before Twitter really blew up, you know, all these conversations, you know, about like, should we be starting this guy? Like, you know, what's our play calling doing? All of that stuff. Like that's happening on message boards, right? Oh yeah. Um, but the big difference there is you have mod- moderators. Yes. And in most cases, you know, I'm only really familiar you know, with like a host states, um, related sites, but you know, very, pretty aggressive, you know, people will get kind of dealt with immediately. And honestly, like, you know, you see other commentators then, or commenters then, um, I think reacting to that in a positive way in which then there becomes like a level of self-policing. Like, Hey, we don't do that here. Yeah. Or like, calm down. That's not, that's not how we act here. Yes. Like, okay, you've had a bad day. Take a break, take a breather and come back when you can say nice things. <laughs> right. Yeah. You can come out of the grays. Um, yeah. But I think that it, it just is this place now where you can just do whatever you want. And that tends to bring up the, the worst in people broader. Oh, yeah. And obviously, you know, what we've been talking about, which, is, you know, the college athletes. Yeah. Yeah. No. So I think all of that, you know, really interesting perspectives too. And, and a couple of things I hadn't thought about, but yeah, I think that's just social media is a wonderful thing, but just like everything, in life, there's a good and a bad to it. And so I think it's hard sometimes to, to look past that bad and to focus on the good. So, um, I think I'm going to take this kind of as my personal challenge now of anytime I do see these athletes posting something about their NIL deals or something good that they want to celebrate, you know, making sure that I am one of those that likes it, retweets it, comments something nice back, you know, because they do, they do work really hard. They don't, get paid enough if they even have an NIL deal. Some of them don't, but yeah, I think, I think this is a good, good wake up call. Just even for me personally to be like, Hey, just remember that that person on the other end, they have feelings too. <laughs> well, a lot of it's too. It's like, would you ever dream of saying something like that to somebody in person? Oh no, never. These people would never say this stuff to your face. I mean, I, I obviously, because they're, they're hidden by the internet, but also like no same person's ever going to say anything like this to another person. Right. Um, exactly. You know, and I mean, I think it's hard too, because, you know, it, it, you want to think again, because these are kids, but people treat them like, and I think it's all athletes. And it goes back to like what we're talking about with like fantasy too, of the, you know, people going after, I don't know, like Zeke, because he didn't score enough points for them. And not realizing that they are going to take that. And like, it's actually going to affect them. Like they're not, they're not, they don't, they do not exist in this world solely, you know, to benefit your fantasy team or so, you know, your favorite team wins and everybody has bad days. And they're not just like, and you're like, you know, I'm sure some people would be like, well, I mean, I'm not actually like targeting anyone specifically, but it's bigger than that because these kids are also like, they're seeing everything, you know, they, they see, Oh, my school's trending and yeah. Okay. Maybe they didn't get called out by name, but they're seeing like all of these negative things said about their school, about their coaches, um, you know, about their team, you know, even, you know, like calling them lazy, whatever. And that's going to have an effect. Even if you are like, Oh, well, but I didn't say anything bad about anyone in particular. It's just, and I think that gets back to the point too. Yeah. You're supposed yeah. to have some joy in this. Exactly. Sports are supposed to be joy if all you're doing is being, you know, like angry about it. Yes. I know it's 
Yeah, sports are my happy place. Um, I do get frustrated. I do yell a lot. I you you were talking about being a pacer. I'm a total pacer. I also have weird superstitions, but as I tell everybody, they're only weird if they don't work, and they usually work. So we'll, we're we're going to stick with them, right? <laughs> Hey, if you're cool, let's take a quick break. And then when we come back, I want to wrap things up because I want you to give me your take on Tattoo Gate uh, and then a couple of other things. So we'll be right back. Y'all stay tuned. And we're back with Megan. So Megan, I know you reached out after last week's episode. And of course, my little SEC loving heart, I gave my two examples, but Tattoo Gate, that's your that's your big NCAA scandal. So I want to hear all of your thoughts on it and kind of get your perspective from it and what that was like. Because it again, looking back on it now and knowing the way things are now, it seems so insane. <laughs> Well, I mean, so anyone who is not aware of Tattoo Gate, um, so it happened in 2010. Well, I mean, who knows? I don't know exactly when the violations happened, but it all started to come to light in 2010. And basically, um, we had five Ohio State players, including um, our quarterback at the time, um, <clears throat> Terrell Pryor, and they had taken some Ohio State memorabilia and they had basically in essence traded it for tattoos at this tattoo parlor. And it, so it was like jerseys. And, uh, the one thing that you know, I think always got to Ohio State fans was if you win, um, against Michigan, I don't know if you knew this now, but you get golden pants. Oh, yes. Um, so, you know, you'd have some guys who have like four sets, um, but that was like something that they traded. And I think like some championship, or, um, not championship, but like bowl game rings mm-hmm. and, um, they came out. So they did this. And I mean, I think the value was around like a thousand, I think at most like $2,000, um, because tattoos are not cheap. No, they're and not. And <laughs> it came out because then actually the tattoo parlor, um, was being investigated by the feds for like something else. I do not remember now, but that's when it all starts to come out and it blew up. And it's so, you know, you feel so bad for the players now. And I think it's such a, it's such a, an encapsulation of why kind of the NIL was necessary. And certainly, you know, I think even at the time there was a lot of kind of morality police, like, Oh, who needs tattoos? Like that's not something you need, but you know, who are we to tell kids what to spend their money on? Like, you know, another player might have, like, you know, had had the opportunity, maybe got into PlayStation, something like that. You know, I mean, again, these are kids. And, you know, honestly, I, I think you would agree. They, they deserve some spending money. Yes. Oh, and, absolutely. You know, how they're going to spend that, that's nobody's business. So, um, anyway, at the end of the day, so it comes out and then this kind of drags out in the, how it's handled with the NCAA for a while. Initially, um, it, I think it, it all kind of comes out I want to say in like December of 2010 and they've just had, they've just come off with like a fantastic season. I think they went 12 and one that year. Um, most of the guys who were involved in this had, you know, kind of like record setting years. Um, you know, I think, you know, three of them, like, so it was, Terrell Pryor was the quarterback, and he had, excuse me, he was, like, top 10 career passing yards for Ohio State, um, and then, um, DeVere Posey, who's a wide receiver, also, like, top five career record, um, then you had Boom Heron, um, and he was, like, a top 10 all-time rusher, and then you had Mike Adams, who was, like, All-American that year, and, you know, obviously at the end of the day, all of those records get wiped. And so they lose all of that. 
three of the guys end up going into, um, you know, they, they ride out their suspensions. They get five game suspensions the next year and, you know, kind of ride out their suspensions, go into the draft. I think they all you know, may have stayed like a year, like, but they all end up in the draft. They all kind of kick around the NFL for a while. Um, you know, play for at least a couple of years. And, um, you know, prior at the time, you know, was, you know, when he was being recruited, even through, you know, college football, like he, you know, was considered to be very, very talented. Right. He um, initially takes the suspension, but then decides he's just going to go into the supplemental draft. Um, and he's going to withdraw from the university by the time this kind of all plays out um, the next summer. And I think where it also gets really interesting is that not only, I mean, you, you look at like, what, what did that cost him? Like, what would he have gone if he'd been, you know, in the regular draft and also not kind of probably had like this reputation of, you know, being a potential troublemaker yeah. because, you know, not that it's his fault, but you had a kind of unique situation there where the NFL actually ended up also punishing him. Um, so again, like the guys who stayed at Ohio State, they got a five game suspension. The NFL actually then gave Pryor a five game suspension when he went to the NFL, which I think you know it's, it, you can debate how that all plays out too. Right. And you know, did the did the crime actually warrant this? And you know, how is the NCAA influencing then what the NFL is doing? Um, and you know, bigger points around consistency. Um, but, um, and then of course you have the fallout with the coaching. Um, so Jim Pressel was the coach at the time. Um, he's pretty widely beloved in the Ohio state community. Um, you know, considered to be a very good guy. I mean, he's now, he just, I think retired this year. He's the president of, um, Youngstown state again, like known for like playing, putting like players and students first. And, you know, this whole thing happens there, um, and that brings in the whole Urban Meyer era of yes. college football and at Ohio State. Um, and it's just really, you know, like that's another thing that's so interesting about this too, right? Because if this doesn't happen, does Urban Meyer go back to college football coaching? Right. Right? Because, like, otherwise, you, cause you, you just look at the what's happening at the time. Like, I, I mean, you can disagree on this, but... I don't see a situation where he goes to another SEC school, right? Oh, no. I There's no way. So let's say he is, like, thinking about he wants to coach again at this time. Well, and, you know, there are, all, like, everybody always talks about the schools that, you know, he said he would go to. And it's, like, Notre Dame, Penn State, Ohio State, and, like, there's some debate over Michigan. But if you just kind of look at the facts at the time, it's, it's it kind of an interesting hypothetical because you've got – he just got Ryan Kelly hired at Notre Dame like the year before. Yeah. He's not going anywhere. Right. Right. Um, so being in the Brady Hoke era at Michigan, um, you know, how long that might've lasted if urban was on the table, you know, who knows, but you know, I think also coming off of like the rich bad era, urban style might not have been seen as a great fit. Just right. considering everything that happened with Rich Rod. Um, you know, Penn State's about to blow up and become toxic. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, and then, you know, nobody, like, Urban's never going to go there after everything that happened. Well, and they want a coach that is going to be fully clean. And let's be honest, that's not Urban Meyer. Well, also that. But just, you know, if you're thinking about, like, where he could have gone in the college football landscape, you know, and once you get, like, Hoke and – Brian Kelly locked in these contracts, you know, I think a lot of fans want to be like, Oh, you know, you could just drop them and get, go to the better option. But like, that's not how contracts work. Right. Um, and like what buyouts look like and how expensive this all is for the schools. Um, so, you know, it, so you're in, you're kind of locked into all these coaches. I mean, the only other one, I guess you could put potentially on the table is USC, but they're coming off of their own problems, you know, with Reggie Bush and Pete Carroll fleeing to the NFL okay. and even started the Lane Kiffin era and everyone's pretty hyped on him at that point um, for, yes. for 
you know, whatever it's worth. Um, <laughs> Man, we've come such a long way. <laughs> exactly. But at the time, he was, you know, considered to be a, a very, very good catch. And so really, you know, if Tattoo Gate doesn't happen, and uh, Tresla's contract at the time was through 2014, you know, I, I, within the Ohio State community, I think you could have a debate over whether or not the program would have achieved the levels that fans expect it to, you know, if he could have continued to evolve with the times. But I think after what happened with the two national championship losses, like really seeing the program is on an upswing at that point. Um, again, you're 12 and one, you know, then the NCAA makes this very self-serving decision to not do anything when they find, when this all comes to light in December and let them play the sugar bowl against Arkansas, um, which then they win and they have a great game. So arguably, you know, adjustments have been made. The program is on an upswing. No reason to, to get rid of Trussell through his contract. Um, you know, I think if Tattoo Gate doesn't happen, I, I would bet money he gets to, regardless of anything happens, I don't, I think it would continue to be on the same trajectory. But regardless of what happens, I think he gets to ride out his contract and retire on his own terms. Right. If he wants to. Right. So that locks up Ohio State. So, like, where does Urban Meyer go from, you know, call it 2010 to 2014 if he wants to get back into college football? Right. But, you know, I, I can't I, – I was actually thinking about it earlier because we've been talking about it. I'm like, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know that he waits until – if Ohio State's, like, his dream job. I don't know that he necessarily waits until Trestle's ready to retire. Slash, at that point, have you been grooming Luke Fickle to take over the program? And do you – like, is Urban Meyer that attractive? Again, if we're playing out the hypothetical in, like, 2014-15 right. that you just pivot all of your planning to pick up Urban Meyer, who at that point has it coached in, you know, what, six years? Yeah. So we could have – if Tattoo Gate doesn't happen, we could have just never had another Urban Meyer era in college football. Yeah. Which is just wild to me because he was such – an integral part of that, like that time frame, right? And and you're right because you do have the Lane Kiffin at USC. You have all of this happening, and so you're starting to see these younger guys come in. And Urban is by no means, you know, an old guy, but he's a younger guy who has that proven, like, winning record, and that he can take programs and go do good things with them and go compete for national championships. And so. I think, yeah, that was just, it was kind of that weird, perfect storm that happened. But, you know, I, I remember looking up when you were, you said you, you know, wanted to talk tattoo gate. I looked up the amounts and we're talking like $2,500 that these mm-hmm. kids got. Like yeah. we're not talking. Well, and it's not even money. I mean, it was services. Yeah. Um, and it's so. For stuff um, that they arguably owned and you no, know, yeah. granted, like even today with the NIL, you wouldn't be able to do this. Right. Right. You cannot take your game jersey. You can't take your memorabilia as long as you are affiliated with that school and sell it. Right. Exactly. Because then that brings, I mean, obviously we've got this whole kind of fiction that the schools are not anything to do with the NIL. Right. Um, but at the same time, this never happens if you have the NIL. True. It, there's never a need for these guys to go and do this because they are, you know, getting their piece of the NIL pie. Yeah. Um, And they can even go and get tattooed for free, quote unquote, and then let the tattoo shop post a social media post with them getting tattooed there. Exactly. And that's all perfectly fine now. So yeah, it's crazy to me how even things like that, just, it changed everything. Um, Coaching wise, you know, landscape wise, just with programs as a whole, because programs like have crumbled for this kind of stuff. Absolutely. Well, and I think it's also, I mean, you know, this will, this will show my, I, I, you know, I will not offer any opinion on it besides to say it is interesting because I do not want to, you know, show my bias, but I do think it's very interesting how what's happening with Michigan and Harbaugh now yes. and this whole like, Oh, you're going to be suspended for four games next year. Just kidding. It'll be a year from now. Yeah. Like, oh yeah, we don't accept your, your punishment. So we're going to wait a whole year. Okay. Well then what if he goes to the NFL? 
which is probably what's going to happen because like this oh, yeah. is where I do have some sympathy for Michigan because it does seem like your coach is trying to bolt to the NFL. Oh, yes, absolutely. And, and I think you also have the situation. Like, I mean, then, but that goes back to like, you know, USC happens and Pete Carroll bolts to the NFL and there's no punishment or anything for him. Like he personally yeah, gets out of it completely scot-free. Yeah. And I think that's, that's part of the, the stuff that bothers me too, and some of the NIL legislation that has been brought up um, specifically by the wonderful former coach named Tommy Tuberville, who's now a U.S. Senator. Good job, state of Alabama. Way to show what we really prioritize down here, and that's obviously football. But he put in there, you know, the legislation, it's that a kid has to stay for three years at the school they originally signed with. Okay, well, say this happens there and a kid wants to bolt and go somewhere else because, oh, crap, the coaches aren't there anymore or, ooh, we're going to be put on probation. Like, Or even not even if something happens. Like, the coach, like, like say, like, take whatever is going to happen with Harbaugh and the NCAA right out of it. Yeah. Like, if this is the same situation a year ago we're having this conversation, you know, and we've gone through Jim Harbaugh trying to go to the NFL for God knows what time. Right. Like, what if your coach leaves? Like, not because anything happened. Yeah. Not because, like, anything bad. Like, there's nothing bad. It's just your coach decided he wants to go to the NFL. Yeah. Like, you know. That's it. You you know, there's no, you're not trying to get away with anything, but, you know, you don't have a right to decide who you want to play for. Exactly. No, I, I, I don't like that. I don't, I don't like it at all. Um, It's very it's very restrictive. It's very controlling. Um, and I think it goes back to exactly what you said earlier. It just, it's a way to continue to hold them as commodities instead of people. And I, I have a big problem with that. So yeah, it's, it's kind of gross, but no, I think those are really interesting takes though on tattoo gate and and good analysis of like, okay, if this hadn't happened, then what about this or this and this team's coach? And I think, you know, those are things too, that, people don't realize stuff like that plays out. And like, here's and, a question for you, Mel. And yeah. you know, answer. I mean, you can think about it for your next episode, but how do you feel about, you know, I, so all of the guys who are involved with tattoo gate have petitioned to have their, their records reinstated. Right. Yeah. And obviously Reggie Bush asked to have his Heisman back. Mm-hmm. Do you think that they should get them back? Yes. I mean, I do obviously, but, yes. um, you, you earned know. it. It doesn't matter. To me, it doesn't matter what happened off the field. You earned that. I mean, Johnny Manziel admitted on his, on untold that he didn't take his own piss test while he was at Texas A&M. Are they going to take his Heisman away from that? From him for that? Good. I mean, and that's where you get into like all these double standards too. Yeah, absolutely. And so I, yeah, no, they absolutely don't even I have to think about that. it. That makes me see like I would be so angry if I was Richie Bush. Yes, like, seriously. Yes, the Heisman. Oh, I'm gonna have to do a whole episode probably on the Heisman because they lost so much credibility with me um, when Peyton Manning did not win. Well, I think it's just so like I mean I, I have other thoughts on that, and I know we need to wrap it up, but I, I just think it's it's interesting too if you do that episode of how it's become just, it's, it's really just become an award for the top quarterback. Really, really. Yeah, it has. Once in a while we throw in, you know, like a running back, but like, it, it's really just about the top quarterback and, you and know, I don't, that's not what it was supposed to be. No. And who's the most popular player? I mean, let's be honest. Does Manti Teo make it to the top three if the whole world doesn't feel bad for him and his girlfriend? That, I, mean, yeah, I mean, that also raises questions of like, what were we doing as journalists? Exactly. Oh, yes. So many journalistic <laughs> questions here, too. So, yeah, we'll definitely have to uh, probably have another episode on just that, and we'll get into all of those, because I know you've got to get that sweet pup to bed, and mine are acting crazy. So, um, But to wrap it up, I have started asking all my guests this, so I've got to know yours. If you had a walkout song, what would it be? Well, I think that the closest analogy I can give you is like when my husband and I got married, um, you know, there's kind of the tradition that you do um, where like the wedding party gets announced and everything. Yes. And we were both fully aligned that 
the song we wanted leading up to that was the <clears throat> version of Hang On Sleepy by the Ohio State Marching Band that includes the acapella singing by the band of Hang On Sleepy. So um, I'm sure you were not familiar with that. I am not, but I will now go check it out. <laughs> um, because we do have um, at Ohio State, the I think fairly undeniably the best uh, damn band in the land. So, yeah, they're pretty good. Um, but yeah, so that, that would, I, I would have to pick that because it gives me goosebumps every time I hear it. I love that. I, I'm now actually going to have to go find it and listen to it. Um, yeah, so I, I really love that. And I think it's it's true to your roots and that's what a walkout song is supposed to be. So I like that answer. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll have to find you the link and send it to you. Okay, awesome. Yeah, and I'll have the same effect on you. But. Yes, I was going to say, I will also link it in the blog post for this week's episode. So if you're listening, it'll be in the blog post. Go find it. So, perfect. Well, Megan, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. And um, I know we'll chat in Bully Book Club soon, but I hope you guys have a good night and as much luck to your Buckeyes as as I can give you. Um, if somehow our, my rebels play your Buckeyes, then I don't know that I'll be wishing you a whole lot of luck. But other than that, I hope you'll have a good year. I'm, I'm excited to watch. Y'all actually did get a kid that transferred to Ohio State from Ole Miss. His name is Taiwan Malone. He plays baseball and football, and I think he's going to be a really good good fit for y'all. I think he's actually going to play both ways as well. So I'm, really? I'm going to be watching him. Oh I'm a fan. That's awesome. Yeah. I so I don't see that at all anymore. That's great. Yeah. So cool. awesome. Well, thank you again, Megan. I hope you have an awesome night. Yeah, you too. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thanks. Bye. All right. Thanks so much for joining us for episode four of the stare down blindsided. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have any feedback for us, you can always find us on Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it. It's at the stare down pod. You can find us on Instagram at the stare down underscore podcast. Email us at our Gmail account, the stare down pod at gmail.com. Find us on Facebook, the stare down podcast, or go to the alabamatake.com. Today's blog post will be up as well. So if you want to leave some comments on that, enjoy my puns and all of the things that go along with it, you're more than welcome to. But until next time, remember, sit back, relax, grab a drink or two, and enjoy the stare down. <laughs>